Okay, <clears throat> we're getting ready to read chapter 10 of Cracker, the best dog in Vietnam by Cynthia Katahata. Um, yesterday, we when we finished off with chapter nine, we know that um, the dog handling teams had finished up their training at Fort Benning, Georgia, and the men had been allowed to have a period of leave of about a month, I think, um, so that they could go home and visit their families before um, they left to Vietnam. And um, we know that one of the things that Rick talked about um, as he was at home visiting with family and friends is how he felt so much older and so much different now back at his home. Um, when he got together with his friends, with his classmates that he uh, was in school with, they seemed so much younger um, than he was, so much more mature. His parents even said he seemed so much different. And one thing um, you got to keep in mind, we in yesterday's chapter, I showed you a little clip of uh, an explanation of what conscription or the draft is was when we used it in the United States military. And we know that Rick, he wasn't drafted. And I want you to think about it. When we read the chapter where he discussed going to Vietnam, we know that Vietnam was a hotly contested war, which means um, that the country was divided over whether we should be involved in Vietnam. Now, at first, everybody was all for it. Um, but then as situations and time wore on, we were ready to be out. Um, we wanted our military pulled out of Vietnam. So Rick volunteered to go to Vietnam. He was raised to be a patriot, very patriotic, and um, believed it was his duty. Um, and he wanted to go. He wasn't drafted. So when he first talked to his parents and his grandparents at the supper table about going, signing up, and volunteering to go, he was only 16. Um, because you had to be at least, you have to still to this day, uh, be 17 years old to sign up for the military. But at 17, you're not legal age and you can't sign your own documentation. So you have to have your parents' permission. They have to sign for you to join the military. So sitting at the supper table, he asked his father's permission um, to sign up to go to Vietnam. And of course, his father thought about it and gave his permission. And so keep in mind that when Rick's talking about being more mature than his uh, friends are, you're talking about young men that are probably sophomores or juniors. I was a junior when I was 16, 17. I was actually a senior when I was 17 um, in high school. So they are fairly in the scheme of life. Um, they're fairly young people, especially to be going off to war. So the things that Rick is going to have to deal with and face, he's facing as a 17-year-old young man. So um, I'm pretty impressed with him and his level of maturity, to be perfectly honest. Um, um, so chapter 10 is fairly short, so we're going to read through it real quick, and then we'll go back and discuss some of the things that uh, they talk about in chapter 10. He was back, but Cracker was mooning so badly she didn't know it until she saw Tristy hopping around her kennel. And then she felt it. He was back. When he opened the cage, she jumped on him so hard she knocked him over. Ow, he said. Bad dog. But then he held her to him. The 24 handlers and their dogs, plus a few extra dogs, separated into three C-130 cargo planes for the trip to Southeast Asia. One soldier drove a deuce and a half, the nickname for a one and one half ton truck, right onto the plane's ramp. Someone else drove a Jeep onto another plane. The men loaded tents, a 105 millimeter howitzer, M16 rifles, ammunition, sea rations, and everything else they would need to be battle ready the moment they landed in Vietnam. All they liked, Rick realized, was real life experience. Cracker kept turning around in her crate for a glimpse at Rick. She saw men scurrying back and forth, carrying boxes and packages. Crates of other dogs surrounded her. Every time Cracker glimpsed Rick, she wagged her tail, but he didn't seem to notice her. Even when he disappeared from sight sometimes, she could often hear and smell him. But she liked to keep him in her sight. 
and strained in her crate for glimpses. She didn't see why she had to wait in here. Finally, Rick and another man carried her in her crate up the ramp and into a big, dark room. Rick knelt down next to her and murmured, Good girl, over and over. We're going for a ride, good girl. She knew ride. And she didn't think he'd leave her like Willie had. She trusted Rick now. She knew he would always come back. She felt sure of it. And she could just see him sitting on the floor, leaning against the wall of the plane. The rumbling grew so intense, she could hardly hear anything else. Some of the other dogs barked and whined. One howled hysterically. Then she felt the air pressure change. She felt like she was rising and rising, and yet she didn't seem to be going anywhere. It was different from the ride away from Willie, and she knew Rick was nearby, but she didn't know what was going on. She could see Bruno in his crate, and she could smell Tristy in hers. Bruno was pressing his nose against his crate. They eyed each other. He wagged his tail, and she wagged hers. Then for a long time, there was nothing to do except sleep and pee. Every so often, Cracker would wake up, and nothing would have changed. The room was starting to smell like urine and other things. She sniffed but couldn't smell Rick in the still air. After a long while, the plane shook and the air pressure began to change. Rick came back and put his nose against the crate, against the gate of her crate. She pushed her nose against his. She sniffed. He smelled good. Good girl, he said. Wet nose. Then he went away again. A few times the plane stopped. Once someplace really cold and twice someplace really warm. Each time, Rick cleaned out her crate, and then she got back in, and the plane took off again, and it was back to the rumbling, to the dim light, and to the funny air pressure. Much later, she could feel something different happening in the room, some excitement among the men. Rick came to kneel by her crate and said urg urgently, Tonsinu, Tonsinu. She wagged her tail, Tonsinu. All right, so I want to show you some of the things that he just discussed. They're finally in Vietnam now. And I want to show you uh, the C-130 plane, cargo plane that they talked about loading. Here's some pictures of, of a C-130 cargo plane. This is a U.S. issued Air Force cargo plane. And here's a view of the back where the loading bay is, the cargo plane being loaded. Um, and it goes, flips completely down and you can drive uh, vehicles in there. Um, a lot of times they use um, aircraft carriers, ships, but in this case, they, they must have flown. Um, here is the one and a half ton, a version of the one and a half ton truck. Um, I don't know. This is probably um, painted with the camo for the, this looks like it's painted with the camo for the jungle, but um, it doesn't look like the digital desert camo. So I thought this would be a pretty good one, but you can see how it's got the ramps and they back it up in there. Um, the Jeeps that they loaded, this is a Vietnam-era Jeep. One of the versions of this one has the, the soft cover top on it. They also, you know, you guys are familiar with Jeeps. This this cover will come off and it'll be open air. But um, This is a picture of a Vietnam-era, um, and you can tell it's retro. Somebody's kept this. Sea ration, an example. I remember he talked about there were different kinds, um, different things that they had in there. This one has candies in it, looks like. This one has cig a pack of cigarettes, and you see it's not a very big pack of cigarettes. Some other things, I can't really read um, what they say. This one has coffee in it, I can tell. Um, and these, I think maybe all three of these cans might be coffee. Um, one of the unusual things that you'll notice um, in this book, uh, and during the Vietnam era, of course, a lot of you, again, have grandparents, um, or grandfathers that fought in the Vietnam War, were in the military. They, they were smokers. Um, it was a socially acceptable thing to do now. Now it's kind of a, you, you can't, you're not really allowed to smoke inside of any buildings. You're not allowed to smoke anywhere. But at that time you were. Um, you, it was not unusual when I was a child uh, to see people smoke in restaurants. Uh, parents smoked in the cars with their children. Um, at schools, uh, the high schoolers smoked, and there was a smoking area. The teachers had smoked in the teachers' lounge. You, it wasn't unusual. There wasn't a big push about how unhealthy it was. It was just they didn't have that knowledge um, about cancer and things like that that was related to, to cigarette smoking. But um, and you know, Rick wasn't eighteen yet, and uh, 
he did smoke and this they the, the military gave these to the guys and it was one of the the words vice but it was one of the things that they did and it when you're in the middle of a jungle and you're scared for your life it, you need something to calm your nerves and I'm sure I would rather someone uh, smoke a cigarette than drink alcohol or do some sort of drugs which would affect your judgment um, than a cigarette doesn't so you'll hear a lot about that and see a lot about that. And you heard Rick say that they wouldn't be allowed to smoke out in the field because you could obviously smell cigarette smoke and alert the enemy. Um, also, he talked about um, using C4 to uh, cook the sea rations to cook their food. And this is a packet of C4. It's explosive. And it's like putty. It's like silly putty um, that you play with and would come in this big packet and you open the plastic wrap up and you pull it out. And you roll it up in a ball and you think it's explosive and it would be dangerous, but it is. But you have to have the combination of heat and impact it has to have a, you know, a smack of some sort to make it explode with the heat. So these guys would take off a chunk of it and they would roll it up in a ball and light it with their lighters and it wouldn't explode. It would just burn. And when it burned, it, it produced a really intense heat. So they would stick it to the bottom of these cans and it would get really hot really fast and, and he'd make their coffee boil instantaneously and it would cook their food instantly because you couldn't start a fire because it would cause smoke and it would alert the enemy to your location. So it would be like, in effect, a way of um, like microwaving your food, if you would. And I'm sure they do something like this even now. Um, but the guys came up with this. This wasn't something that the military did. Um, also, he talked about loading um, the one, 105 millimeter howitzer. This is an example of a Vietnam era one millimeter howitzer. It's sort of like a modern version of a cannon, if you will. Um, I think I've got a picture of a shell somewhere. Um, I see a lot of these alongside the roadways in Vietnam memorials. I think this one is actually a picture of one that's at a, at a, um, a military base somewhere. Um, yeah, um, there's one being fired up there in the corner. And here's, um, this is of course a modern day picture, but this is an example of a shell that would be loaded into one of these howitzers. I couldn't find one, it was in a Vietnam picture. Um, the M16 rifle, that was an American issue. Uh, the Americans use these. Um, this is an automatic weapon. This is an, not something that a civilian such as your eye is allowed to have. Um, this is a, um, and this is a AK-47. Um, this was the weapon that the, the North Vietnamese used um, that they did get from the communists. They get from the Russians, I think. Um, I'm not too good with my history, but I think. And one of the things that you'll hear discussed as we read, and this may be, this may be a modern version. I don't know. I just found these on the Internet. But um, some of you people that know more about weaponry maybe could comment um, on this in the class comments. But... Um, one of the ways the soldiers could tell if they were, when they heard gunfire, if it was the enemy or if it was friendly fire, because a lot of times you're in a jungle, you can't see um, above these huge tall trees. You guys learned about um, the layers of the jungle and the canopy and all that and how tall they are um, was the sound. The guns sounded differently. So when you heard guns fire, uh, you heard rounds going off. You could tell by the sound of the gun, whether it was American fire, friendly fire, they called it, or if it was the North Vietnamese or the VC firing a weapon. Um, so that was one of the things they talked about. Um, so anyway, I thought that was fairly interesting to learn about. And as I say, you, you guys can comment if uh, you want to, if you know some more information about this stuff, because I'm by no means an expert at all.